Race fan, it's cold outside. Follow me, the Monday morning racer, into the next shop tour. <laughs> Well, it's definitely warmer inside in this 1,500 square foot shop that's nestled in a residential area in Grand Island, New York, which is about northwest of Buffalo, New York. And we're in the shop of Grant Farmer. And Grant, he's got his own race car we're going to be checking out here in a few moments. He's also the race master for some of the baddest guys in Buffalo, New York, with some of the baddest cars in the area. And he also is the proprietor for a company that whether you're a consumer on the lower end or the higher performance end can definitely be something you need to check out and help you with your automobile needs. That's all next here in Monday Morning Racer. Folks, we're going to step into this car profile, and behind me we've got this beautiful 87 Buick Grand National. And the owner of it and the driver is Grant Farmer right here. Now, Grant, look, you give me the rundown. What's the specifications on the car that you've got right now? Well, the current form right now, it's in small tire outlaw. Um, so it's it's got a, the rear tire is a 29.5, 10.5 uh, W tire on the back. Uh, it is a big tire car. It's a back half car, so we can fit... Um, anywhere from a 33 inch tall, 18 and a half inch wide tire. Um, the motor is a 434 inch small block Chevy, uh, aftermarket top to bottom, swinging a pair of uh, 75 millimeter turbos, burning methanol, and uh, it's a 25.5 chassis, so it's good to 750s in the quarter right now. So, it's pretty impressive specifications. What's that best time you've had in this car so far? Oh, uh, low fives right now is all we're getting out of it. We're still shaking some bugs out of it. We're in the 140-ish in the mile an hour in the eighth, but uh, hopefully 2020 will bring some, some good fours. Good fours in 2020, that's what Grant's hoping for. Now, folks, you're seeing the car as it is now, but Grant, did you build this? Did you buy it? Uh, what's the metamorphosis on this car? Well, that's, a, <laughs> that's like a love story there. Um, the car started 20 years ago. Uh, bought in North Carolina, a rust-free Buick. Uh, I just wanted to update a nitrous small block car that I had and decided, well, we had it apart, why not put a roll cage in it and some other stuff. Uh, so the snowball started there. Um, I brought it home. One of my sponsors, uh, Clocks Metalcraft, did the, the original 850 car, two by three steel back half, uh, eight, 850 cage in it, mild steel, and that was plenty good for 2,000. <laughs> they were hoping for maybe 800 horsepower and a good day going downhill. Turbos were big, being a Buick. Uh, I didn't have money for the stage two stuff, very expensive stuff, but I had a small block and I figured, you know, nitrous small blocks still sounded good, and then the idea of a turbo small block sounded better. That would have been a revolutionary idea in 2000. It's nothing here in 2020. Um, but uh, that upped the goals. So um, I brought it to my trailer I had in North Carolina, the same 20 foot enclosed trailer I have now. I was in the service at the time, I was in the Army in Fort Bragg. And um, 
I started putting the car together in a, in a trailer in a parking lot. Uh, was doing the tin, was fitting fiberglass, uh, modified the cross member up front, anything I could do in a trailer, which is pretty limited. Uh, never got the car to run down there, brought it up to home, you know, Grand Island, New York, and it took another 15 years about to get it to the track. <laughs> uh, at home is when we finally had the, the space and the time and the finances, frankly, to, to finish it. Uh, the fiberglass, it's got a fiberglass tail, doors, nose, all that got fitted. Uh, the goal had changed even more so, so now it needed a 750 chassis, so I installed uh, all the bars, modified the cage for the funny car cage and stuff, and uh, built a new motor. Uh, the, the, the first motor that went in this that ran up until about last year before we started making changes to it. Um, that motor uh, was a 383 cubic inch small Chevy. Pretty much the same motor as this. We just were able to get our hands on some used parts to, to make the 434 that you see now. Um, and then between fuel injection changes, small tire racing becoming a big thing here in Western New York, and uh, the competition, small changes between turbochargers and fuel injection and injectors and change of fuel from E85 to methanol, um, uh, that got us in a quick down and dirty to where you see it right now. Definitely, and guys, as you have heard from him, he's not just a driver. He's the builder. He's the tuner. Uh, he's the brains behind the operation. He's also currently the brains behind the operation of another outfit here in upstate New York, and that is the Buffalo Street Outlaws. <laughs> Buffalo Street Outlaws is the premier small tire racing in Western New York. Um, we started, Rob Kozak actually started the BSO, as we nickname it, Buffalo Street Outlaws. Uh, I can't remember the year, 2017 I think was the first time we ran officially uh, to bring small tire racing to Western New York. It had been big down south with the 10.5 Outlaw stuff and it had never really been embraced up north. We were still big tires, bracket race favored cars. and Small tire racing gives a unique opportunity for guys to bring big horsepower, uh, exciting cars that are on the edge of control most of the time, uh, but limit the size of the tire. And that, that's what really keeps the cars kind of equal. We can have a 2,000 horsepower car running a 1,500 horsepower car, or sometimes a 1,500 horsepower running a 3,000 horsepower car, and they'll run neck and neck because that small tire is what keeps everything lined up. The BSO has grown from a small experiment uh, that Rob had run for a few years, and when he had finally handed it off uh, to somebody else, it had grown into this huge organization of racers, uh, kind of like a club, kind of a professional group that races five times or so during the year, and encompasses probably 45 racers. On a night, we'll have 35 or so racers. So Grant, look, you have got this title as Race Master <laughs> with the uh, BSO, so what other than being the complaint department do you all handle for the BSO? Well, this job, I am the fourth person to be the Race Master for the Buffalo Street Outlaws. Uh, Rob Kozak had it, got passed off to a gentleman named Shane Bartella. Shane passed it off to Chris McKenzie, and now it has fallen in my lap. Uh, the Race Master is the guy that really wrangles what are sometimes like trying to herd upset cats uh, into this this funnel of rules, uh, time requirements, and it it's, it's a difficult job that I didn't really plan on doing, but uh, I was helping out Chris McKenzie, the last race master, and then as things progressed, I was doing more and more, and now I'm... Um, I'm doing it. So right now we do not only the rules, which is always a fun topic with the racers, uh, the phone rings every time I make a new rule change, um, do the scheduling with the track, uh, merchandising, promotion, kind of it's a real small group as far as the management side, so it's kind of a one-stop shop for everything goes through me right now. All right, so the BSO, y'all had a I think a good 2019, but there were some up and downs because you're <laughs> participating at a track that you didn't even know if you were going to be running at. With that in mind, and now looking to 2020, 
what are the top things in store for Buffalo Street Outlaws? What are you looking forward to as a race master? You brought up a really good point. We started off 2019 not knowing if we'd have a track. It was this time of year we were still motivated last year. As the winter drug on into February, we really had to come to terms with the idea that we weren't going to have a track no more. It was mildly depressing. Sometimes it was more than mild in the depressing sense to feel, to feel and think that where we loved to race was going to be no more. We got a real windfall, so to say. Out of nowhere came the management team that, that bought the track. Uh, Vito Ananacelli and his wife, uh, Sylvia, have been running the track for the last year, doing an excellent job. They've been really great with the BSO, and we really had to put together a season in 2019. We did the best we could. Uh, we got dates on the calendar, we got racers involved, and the racers and the track together put on a really good season that was missing some little tweaks, uh, but we just didn't have time to do it. So looking to 2020, um, we're looking to do the same number of events, four or five. Uh, we're looking, we have a partnership of sort the track does, not us directly, with um, Ian Hill Productions. They're going to come down and put on a race that we ran last year called Unfinished Business. Uh, it was a great race. It was a Friday test. It was a Saturday race. The guys loved it. We got to camp at the track. Um, but on the, on the Buffalo Street Outlaw side, we're going to do some more Friday nights. We're going to have, I believe, our own Friday and Saturday night race as the BSO. Give guys a chance to come together. Uh, give the fans a little bit more opportunities to see the guys not only Friday night when we're testing. And the testing can be interesting in and of itself because we, if, knowing that we have Friday to test and then we're going to have Saturday, we're going to have two qualification passes. Uh, it gives us more opportunity to really crank the wick up, so to say, and it gets pretty exciting for the fans to see these cars more out of control probably than they normally would see because we have more opportunity to really push the limits of the track. And we know that whatever we tune for Friday, we can use on Saturday. So it, it's, it, it should be interesting. Um, we have a new website. That's actually the banner off the website going together. We're going to have apparel that will be sold on there for the fans that just want a little piece of the, the Street Outlaws. And um, we're going to be in the Buffalo Motorama this year with uh, paired up with the track and uh, some of the newer cars that are coming out. So it should be an exciting year. All right, Grant, you've got a beautiful Grand National. You're the race master of the Buffalo Street Outlaws. You're also the proprietor of the fuelinjectorservices.com behind us that you've got set up here. But before you became racer, race master, and an individual fixing stuff for the regular car and the race car with injectors, you were in the service. So definitely want to take the time and, and ask you why did you join the military? What did you do in the military? What branch? And how did it go from military to being in racing and where you're at now? <laughs> well, I went in the military because I'm a bad panic slash uh, spontaneous buyer. <laughs> and uh, a recruiter called me and said, hey, look at all these great things we could have for you. And uh, yeah, I bought that job. <laughs> so next thing I know, I was in, uh, I, I knew I wanted to be involved in aviation. I've always, I've, I played with RC airplanes as a kid and I always loved aviation. So I said, "If you, I'll go in, but it's gotta be something aviation. So I, I, I really got a dream job. I was a helicopter flight engineer of the army. Uh, did six years, uh, 2,600 flight hours with them, and uh, really enjoyed it. Got to go to Afghanistan, see the beautiful landscape that it has to offer. <laughs> uh, and I, I enjoyed my six years. It was actually hard to get out. Grant, look, thank you for your time in the service. Appreciate you serving our country. So why racing? How did you get the racing bug? It started in high school. Um, I had friends that were, were racing. One of my, another one of my sponsors. That's why they're all in the back window. They're all important to me. Uh, Bill Click was a drag racer, and I was in a four wheelers and three wheelers and stuff. And um, he said, you know, why don't you get involved in cars? You, it's the same thing. So that's what I, I kind of did. I, I started. Well, my first car was a car I bought from the uh, boss that I worked for. He had a, an old ratted out '84 Buick Regal. It was all rusted, um, so we took the time to uh, put a motor in it. The motor got a little nitrous and some compression and whatnot, and before you know it, I was, I was racing in high school. 
And uh, the garage I worked at here on Grand Island, there was a gentleman that came in. Um, he used to take our bad coffee at the end of the night, and he was on the way to work. And really nice guy, uh, always had a joke, and I didn't really know what he did. And one day a guy was said, hey, you know, that guy builds top fuel Harley Davidsons. And I said, he doesn't build top fuel Harley Davidsons, you know. If you saw the gentleman I'm talking about, Jim DeTulio, Puppet, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so Puppet came into work every day, and I didn't know it till one day I went to go visit Puppet's shop that he built top fuel Harleys. And um, after a few, almost a year and a half or so, a few, I'd say more than a few months, he gave me the opportunity to come in and help him out. And that, that finished setting the bug in. I got to see chassis being built and motors, and here's, you know, these you know, uh, Larry McBride and Jim McClure, and these guys are coming in to pick up bikes. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just addictive. And uh, shortly thereafter, I went in the service because I graduated high school. And through the whole time I was in the service, I was either still dreaming about drag racing or I was in the process of building this car. And um, it had just been, a, by that time, the hook was set. I was, I was bought and sold. And now when I'm not, doing my day job and cleaning fuel injectors, I'm racing. Right, so even the day job, uh, though you are still an aviator and mm -hmm. you're still involved in that, even though you're out of the service, the day job is you owning this injector service company that cleans and repairs injectors, correct? Well, I got two day jobs. I have, um, I fly planes for a living. I, you know, when I got done with the service, still loved aviation, so I, I started um, doing more civilian flight training and before you know it I was I flying jets for a living so my job is amazing I get to go fly all over the place and get to see really cool things but I'm I'm given a lot of a lot of free time so my wife being a stay-at-home mother um, there's always more finances that could be made and I, I was thinking what could I do and um, my car in particular has 16 fuel injectors on it I needed to start cleaning fuel injectors so I bought the equipment with the hope that I could clean enough to pay off the equipment. Uh, I had an idea in mind that nobody else was doing it locally and maybe I could fill in that, that hole. And uh, about a year and a half later, uh, I got a website, I got a lot of business. Um, and between doing race car fuel injectors and remanning OEM fuel injectors with a business partner of mine, um, we got like 6,000 fuel injectors that we've, you know, we're on the shelf ready to go. Um, so that's, you know, we're not flying planes, I'm out here flowing fuel injectors. <laughs> so what's the process of getting these fuel injectors back in good shape? It depends where they come from, but the process is generally the same. Even an OEM one or a race one, they go through the same process. They're dirty and they come to me. Um, going through a race car fuel injector, because that's, you know, obviously the race car, that's what I get a lot of. Um, two, two scenarios. One is yearly maintenance. You guys just want to make sure that their very expensive motor isn't destroyed by the a few dollars in service. Uh, secondly, they have a problem. They have a motor that they either hurt a cylinder or they have, it's just not running right. So they'll come to me and the first thing we do is take the injectors out of the box, they go right in the machine. They're flowed right, right from the get-go because I want to identify any problems before I start tinkering with it. I don't want to clean it or anything. I want to see if there's anything wrong. Generally, the fuel injectors are not the problem. Uh, every once in a while, I, if you guys see me on Facebook or whatnot, when they're a problem, I like showing them off because when they're a problem, they're usually catastrophically bad. Um, I've had injectors that will literally, when pressure's applied, will shut themselves off. I have ones that will um, not stop flowing uh, when, they're, when they're commanded to, so the motor just fills up with fuel and it can hydrolock a motor. Uh, once I've, I've done an initial flow, good, bad, or indifferent, no matter what happens, they go in a first of two ultrasonic cleanings. Um, have a big tank, they go in there, uh, and there, it depends on how dirty they are when I get them. Anywhere from 10 minutes to 15 minutes usually, that'll knock the dirt off the outside, get them looking good. That starts the process of cleaning the inside of the fuel injector. Once they're done there, um, they go in a second high-powered small tank with a really clean fluid in it um, that finishes cleaning inside the pin hole. The machine actually actuates them as they're being cleaned to get to get all the ultrasonic frequency uh, into the, the injector. And then once they're done there, we replace filters if they have them, uh, and then they go get a second flowing, and we see where we're at as far as if they're working or not. If they're not working, we can redo that whole process one more time and see if we get them back. If they don't come back after that, I just don't trust them enough to stamp them off. Um, usually what I'll do, whatever they flow, uh, we'll mark it on the sheet that, you know, that, that should be replaced. 
Um, and if, but if they all flow good, they get a second flow sheet. Usually, even on the best injectors, we still see a percent or two in a variance from the worst to the best flowing injector. And um, we vacuum pack them and get them back in the customer's hands with a flow sheet and everything. They, everything we did is, is, is annotated on a sheet um, from when it comes in, uh, the, the coil resistance, uh, the two flows, anything we saw, and then the um, what parts are replaced is all on a sheet that they get to take home and that way they have reference to it uh, down the road. So no matter what the injector is, you need to check out Grant Farmer and his fuelinjectorservice.com. He'll be able to hook you up and get those injectors clean and right for you no matter what the application.